spiritual needs, physical needs, emotional needs, psychological needs, financial needs, Father, whatever it is, you, you alone are the answer. And I just ask, Father, that you would just touch each and every one here in this uh, house and those who are at home still worshiping at home who have joined us through the internet, Father. Your spirit can reach them just like you can reach everyone here. And we just thank you and praise you, Father. We ask right now, Father, that you would also touch Pastor Lori as she is not feeling well this morning and not able to be with us, Father. But I ask that your warring angels go and fight for her, Father, and give her peace and rest this morning so that she would be refreshed and renewed. And Father, we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise because you are worthy of it all. In Jesus' name. Silence. 
everybody. Welcome back to New Life Online. And uh, I'm excited to be with you again this week. And I pray that you've been having a great week. And uh, just, man, what a fantastic time. And uh, praise and worship. And I know that you've been blessed by that. And you felt the Spirit of God right there in your homes or your car, wherever you are, listening to this uh, message. And uh, hopefully you're not driving and watching it, but perhaps just listening to it. Mr. Ken, there you go. Uh, shout out to Ken, who is always faithful to listen on the road. And uh, anyhow, um, man, the praise team is just, I'm so grateful for them and their commitment and then everybody behind the scenes. And I know I say that every week, but I just want you to know that they do such a fantastic job. And I'm just super, super excited to be leading a, such a wonderful group of people who love the Lord, who love what they're doing, who, who love to praise God and uh, and who make it so easy for us to get right in the presence of the Lord um, through worship. And so shout out to the praise team and the band. Um, and uh, let me remind you as well, while we are uh, while we're in our transition time here, that uh, if you haven't done so already, you have an opportunity to uh, be faithful in stewardship and giving. You can just click that link that's in the description, or there'll probably be one show up in the in the comments before it's over with. Um, and just just click that. It's a one-click. Go right to our giving portal uh, through PayPal, or you can mail that in if you want to. Some of you have been doing that, and uh, look, keep it up. God's been faithful to us. God's been faithful to you, and you be faithful. And man, it's just been fantastic to watch God work through this whole thing. So many testimonies of God's faithfulness. People who've been getting new jobs, promotions, they thought they were going to get laid off, but they didn't. And God is just opening up doors and you'd say, well, this is the time when it seems like it's going to be depressed and, and recessed. But no, not for God's people. And I'm just proclaiming that and I believe that. That it's just going to keep going up and up and up. And, uh, you know, uh, we don't base everything by our finances. We don't base everything in our lives by jobs and those things. But aren't you glad that God is a God who cares about the details and even the small things in our life uh, like money. And, and you say, well, like money, small. Well, yeah, because you remember the Lord is the one who said, if I can't trust you with something little like money, then how can I trust you with true riches? And that's what we want, isn't it? Amen. So you keep giving, be faithful with that. And uh, we, are, we are grateful and thankful to you for doing that and thankful to God for trusting us and uh, giving us the opportunity to be a blessing and do the ministries, not only that we're doing here at the church, um, but through the church and the, and the families we've been able to bless and, the, and the, the things we've been able to help with. And don't forget, when you give to New Life, you're really just giving through New Life because we, we are just the portal. We're just the, the conduit that God is using for this community and, and we're just trying to do our part. So there you have it. <coughs> there you have it. Sorry. So today we're going to get into this message, and this is uh, not just words, this is our not just words series, week three. And remember that this series is about the Bible, and the title of this message is called The Breath. The Breath. We looked at the first one, it was called The Bread. Last week we looked at The Water, and this week we're going to look at The Breath. Now we're going to have a few more messages in this series, um, but today we're going to look at the breath. And remember that the Bible is not just uh, some words. It's not just a group of words. It's not just any other book. And I don't want you to forget what we said the very first week, that if you can make the Bible just any other book, just any like, like equal to anything in literature, then you get to be God. And you're not. And, uh, and Satan wants to disqualify the Word of God. And if he can do that, if he can cause doubt and cast doubt, or disqualify the Word of God in your mind or in your heart, then He'll have a heyday in your life. And so we want to make sure that you understand that this is the inspired, the, 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 the God-breathed. We're going to be talking about that in just a minute. The absolute Word of God. This Word is actually Christ Himself in, in a print form, if, if that makes sense to you. We've established that through the last couple of weeks. But today we're going to be talking about breath or air. Um, we said uh, last week that we could go about 40 to 80 days without food. You remember I asked that question, how long do you think you could go without food? Experts say about 40 to 80 days, so a couple of months. Water, 
Four to 14 days even is upwards of 21 days. They say four to, to upwards of 21 days without water. But let me ask you this question. How long can you go without air? Think about that. For most of us, just a couple of minutes. Just a few minutes. In fact, I think it's like, <clears throat> I think if I'm not mistaken, I think if your brain goes um, something like six minutes or something like that without any oxygen at all, that that's when you run the risk of starting getting brain damage. That's just off the top of my head, so I could be completely wrong about that, but it's not very long at all. In fact, the world record for holding your breath is 17 minutes and four seconds um, by a magician of all things. Um, but anyways, um, I don't know why in the world somebody would want to hold their breath for 17 minutes and four seconds. I don't, I don't want to hold my breath that long. I, I hold it for just long enough to get to the other side of the pool if I'm underwater and that's about it. You know what I mean? Now, if I found myself in a dangerous situation, I'd probably feel differently if I was in the water. But, but 17 minutes is really, when you think about it, it's not that long, you know? So air is very, very important to the sustaining of life. So what we see in the spiritual, and we look at the, 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 the bread, the water, and now the air, is that, and I told you this the other day, we have Christians and believers that are not only malnourished and thirsty and unbathed. Do you remember last week, we, the last thing I told you was talking about taking a bath? So not only are they malnourished from not eating the bread of life, they're not drinking the water that's living water. They're not bathing in the water of life and letting it bathe them from the outside, but they're also oxygen deprived because they're not breathing. They're not taking in their breath. <clears throat> now I'll connect the word of God and breath in just a second, but let me tell you this. I have four points in this message, but I'm not going to get to those points for a few minutes. It's probably going to be halfway through this message or more before we actually get to those four points. And then I'll read 10 scriptures and then we'll get to those four points and I'll move through them very quickly. Um, and I know some of y'all are sitting at home uh, right now going, yeah, right. But I will, I promise. But I have some very, very important things. Theology uh, wise, I have some very important theology and explanation that you need to know so you can continue to build on the understanding that the Word of God is your life source. I want you to get that in your mind. This is your life. This is not just a book. This is not just something that you should just put in somewhere or include as an addition to your life. This is your life. The Word of God is your life. And I believe when we finish this message today, building on what we've already seen, you're going to say, wow, I, I can understand now why a pastor has been talking about this. Because here, we're in a stage now, we're in a war at words, and the devil wants to steal the word from you, and he wants to take the victory out of your heart, and he wants to get rid of and, and, and discredit the word of God. He wants people to not read the word of God, to not trust the word of God. And we need to, before anything else, what we need to do in this day and age is we need to make a recommitment and, 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 and re... Uh, man, I guess the best way to do it is, is like, you know what, like in a wedding, we, we redo our vows after so many years. Some of us need to redo our vows when it comes to the word. Not that you need to get saved again, but that you need to recommit yourself to reading and understanding and soaking in and taking in the Word of God. Now, let me tell you what the Bible has to say about Word, the Word being breath. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says this. All Scripture, now you may want to underline that word all. All Scripture, notice it didn't say some Scripture, it says all Scripture. It is given by inspiration of God. Now, in the outline that you see, or if you're in the event section, um, in our version app, or in the version app in our event, you'll see that I have underlined uh, the, the, the next five words, a phrase given by inspiration of God. This, this phrase is actually one Greek word, and I'll talk to you about that in just a second because I outlined that as one Greek word and it's super, super important. But let's go back. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete 
thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so the Bible says if we're going to be complete and we're going to be thoroughly equipped for every good work, if we're going to have instruction in righteousness, if we need correction or reproof, and if we need doctrine, if we're going to have doctrine, all of this is given by God, inspired by God, and it's found in His Word, in the Scripture. Now, this phrase that I underlined for you, given by inspiration of God, actually comes from one Greek word that is made up of two Greek root words, kind of a compound Greek word if you want to look at it that way. We have those in English as well. And the word is theo or thea neustos. Thea neustos. It's, it's two, two Greek words that are made up of two words. Thea means God and pneuma which means breath or air. And so pneuma, neustos means God breathed. It means breathed. And so when we look at this word thea neustos, it means God breathed. And that is what we mean when we say that the scripture is inspired. The inspiration of scripture is God breathed. That's what the word inspire means. It has a secondary meaning. Uh, which and we use in our English language or in other languages as well, I suppose, um, which means to have an idea or a motivation. But theologically, the term means that, that, that man breathed in God's word as he breathed out his word into them. He breathed his word into them. They breathed it in and then wrote. I want you to think about words that we have and, and it'll make sense to you. Talking about breathing, pneumonia comes from these same root words. Pneumonia means you got a problem with your breathing. If you have a pneumatic tool, what does that mean? It means it works by air, like a nail gun. So, <clears throat> thea neustos, inspiration of God, means God breathed. But there's another word that we need to see that we often don't connect to God and His Word and that is the word expire. We talked about inspire, which means to breathe in. The word expire means to breathe out. The secondary meaning means to have an end, like an expiration date on something. This is about to expire, or this expired a week ago. They're telling me that all the time. Dad, this milk doesn't taste good. It says it, it's expired. I'm like, let me see it. Hmm? Seems fine to me, right? That's the way you do it. But... No, um, anyways, it means to expire, to breathe out. And so we connect that with, with, with this understanding because not only is the scripture inspired by God, but it is also expired by God, which means that we need to understand the process of how the Bible worked. We were inspired, men, holy men of God, the Bible says, were inspired as they breathed in God's word and he expired his word into them. So God was breathing out his word into holy men and they were breathing in what God was breathing out into them. And while they were breathing out what God was or breathing in what God was breathing out, they were writing the scripture down as the Holy Spirit was inspiring them. Are you following that? The Bible is God. Breathe, And that's so important for us to understand that. In fact, one translation, <clears throat> the NIV, literally uses that word, God breathed. That's the literal word, God breathed. Um, and, and like I said, this is not just any book. This is the very breath of God. It was breathed out and into us for our life. It is our life's breath. Are you following that? Okay, now here's what the scripture says. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. It's talking about prophecy of scripture now. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God breathed in, or God breathed it out, they breathed it in, 
they spoke it just like they wrote it. Does that make sense? When God gives a prophecy, when God moves through his gifts, it's not just people saying things. It's the Spirit of God breathing out his will and his word and man breathing in his word. That's expiration and inspiration. And that's where the message of God comes from. The same thing works when people are preaching or teaching and studying and preparing. In fact, it's even bigger than that. The Hebrew word for breath is ruach. The Greek word is pneuma. We just looked at that. They mean breath of God. You know what else it means? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you what it means. It also means spirit. And so when the Bible talks about the ruach or the pneuma, it's not just talking about that God breathed. It's literally talking about the Holy Spirit himself. So God breathed the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit breathed the word. And I know it's hard for us to get that because we say, well, I thought he's a different person. He is, but understand he's one. And, and don't even try to figure that one out because that'll give you such a brain cramp you want to just quit. You just can't understand the triune God who is three yet one, one yet three. But that's what they are. But the word means the Holy Spirit. The same word used for, for the spirit is the same word used for breath. And so you can see how interconnected and how important the word of God is. It is literally our breath, the breath of God. And he's not just breath, of course. He's God. <clears throat> now you can understand why we sing songs like, This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Some of you are like, I don't recognize that song. You remember this? When it goes like this, here's the tune. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. Desperate. And then in the second verse says this. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your very presence living in me. You understand that connection? This is the air I breathe. Why? Because your breath is your spirit. It's not just your word. It is who you are. It's the Holy Spirit. Very, the pre very presence of God. Look, do you see how intricately interwoven that is? And one of the biggest things that the enemy uses um, to try to, to just distract us and, and deter us is to try to make us think that the Bible's not right or the Bible's not real or the Bible somehow is, is wrong or that you can't trust the Bible or you don't need the Bible. Or here's another one that everybody says when they try to, to, to come against the Bible, they say, the, but, but the Bible has errors in it. The Bible was written by man. Well, first of all, we've already established that the Bible wasn't written by man. The Bible was written by God. It was penned by men. God breathed into them. He wrote what he wanted to write through men. Does that make sense? But they try to say that the Bible has errors. But, but, but it has errors. That it's not inerrant. Listen to me. If you deny the inerrancy of Scripture, if you accept that the Scripture has error in it, then you have to deny the inspiration of Scripture. Because if you say that God made errors, then you're saying that something that came out of God's mouth who was perfect was wrong. And let me tell you something. God doesn't make errors. God is perfect. And if you think you can decide what is good and what is right and what should be used and what should not, what should be believed and what should not, then again, you're trying to be God. And let me tell you one more time, you are not God. But then they say, well, but what about this, Pastor? The men made errors. If God didn't make error, then the men made errors. It was written by men, so the men made errors. Listen, not if the Bible is true, because the Bible says it came out of God's mouth. And into men as they were writing it. Expire and inspire. Remember we just talked about that. Breathed out. Breathed in. Written. Pinned to paper while they were breathing in the scripture. The fresh word of God. He was breathing it out. They were breathing it in. It was flowing right through their intellect. Their spirit. And right onto the papyrus where it appeared. Now I want you to see that. 
Now let me make something clear. When I talk about the inerrancy of Scripture, when we talk about that there are no errors in Scripture, we are talking about the original language. You say, well, then we have translations in other languages, so there must be errors in translations. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but I want to go into this a little bit more. So I got a side note here, and I'm going to try to get through this without getting bogged down. But I need you to understand some things about translations and about modern things in the Word of God. So listen, theologians go to documents called manuscripts that we have in the original languages. It's called the canons. And they translate into other languages. Now, I realize that there are a lot of people that think English is the language that's going to be spoken in heaven. But it's not. In fact, it's not even spoken over most of the earth. Three-fourths of the planet speak Spanish of some form, believe it or not. But some people are so arrogant to think that the only thing that's going to be spoken and the only thing accepted is not just English, but Jacobian English, which is the English from 1600s. 1611 to be exact. Now, I'm not picking on KJV people, but I'm just saying how we think sometimes. Well, what about the people that don't speak English? How about them? I mean, if that's the only thing that gets by, if that's the right one, if that's the right version, if that's the only one we can use. What about when it's translated into Japanese? Or translated into Russian or Arabic or Spanish, huh? So let me tell you about translations. And I do realize that most people are talking about accuracy. So listen, don't get frustrated. Don't get flustered and turn me off because you're mad because I talked about the King James Bible. I like the King James Bible. This right here is a new King James Bible. I don't like the old King James Bible because I don't use these and thous. We, we'll talk about that in just a minute. I like the new King James. I like the NASB. Those are the two primarily ones that I use as a text when I study because they are exact equivalency. And I like that word for word. In fact, you'll see all the scriptures I'm using in this message. In fact, this whole series have come from the new King James Bible. So before you write me a bunch of letters and emails and call me Ichabod and want to run me out of town, just chill out. I'm just telling you that there are other trustable Solid words and you need to quit all this stuff and quit all this. Well, that has an error and this has a problem and that and this and, and some of y'all believe all this stuff. You see it posted on Facebook or you heard somebody say something about something. You just take it as the gospel. If you're going to look at something like that, at least do some study. But be very, very careful. Listen to me, please. I talked about this in my in my Wednesday night lesson this week. Be very careful about learning theology from the internet and social media. I see all this stuff going around and like I said, some people don't even bother to look things up and see if they're real. And you may look at a verse or two or somebody shows you, well, this was changed and this is missing. And you go, yep, there you go. That's the problem. You don't even understand why it's missing or why it was changed or what the process was in the whole deal. I want to tell you, there are very detailed and reasonable, rational, theological reasons why some verses are different in some translations than they are in others. And it has to do with the amount of original documents that were available and that have been discovered. Also, it has to do with how language modernizes and evolves and changes over time. It also has to do with the difference, and that's why we talked about this in our first message, the difference between an exact equivalency of the Bible, which is a word-for-word -word translation, and then something that is called a dynamic equivalency, which is a phrase-for-phrase -phrase or thought-for-thought. -thought. In fact, even the King James <coughs> translators didn't have some words from English that were in Hebrew or the Hebrew was one word and they needed to finish a thought and so they'll just add in a phrase or a couple of words at the end to finish and complete that thought and make it make sense to us and then they put it in the footnotes and all these things by the way in every Bible if it's worth the salt it'll have references it'll have footnotes it'll have indentions and things it'll show you that didn't appear in the original language this was different this has been changed. This word was, was originally this word, and, it, and, it'll, and it'll explain why. In fact, there are painstaking, 
processes to explain, explain why. Look at the front of your Bible. Nobody wants to read that stuff in the front of the Bible, but it talks about that. There are books that are written that talk about why the Bibles are translated certain ways. A skilled committee of 54 translators worked for seven years to carefully complete the King James Translation Project. But did you know that the King James Bible was not the very first Bible to be translated into English? William Tyndale, and many of you recognize that name because you understand Tyndale Publishing. William Tyndale, who was a powerful man of God, wanted to make a translation in English available for everyone, and he used the Greek and uh, the Greek text of Erasmus to make a translation into English in 1534, almost a full uh, 70, 80 years before King James. Tyndale's words were considered so well translated that approximately 70% of the words that he used in the New Testament are found in the King James Bible, taken word for word into their translation. And then there were several others, like the Textus Receptus, to name a very important one, between him and the time that KJV was translated. So they not only had the original manuscripts when they were, you know, using and making the Bible. And I'm just trying to explain to you how all this works. They go back to the original manuscripts, but they also had other translations. They didn't use those translations as their basis. But what they did was they compared them with the original and they thought, that's good. There's no sense in changing that. That's a great translation right there. That's a great explanation. That makes sense to me. In fact, I want you to listen to this uh, statement. That are, it's from the KJV, um, the, the, K, the, the King James Version translators themselves. It says, truly good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make, uh, to make of a bad one a good one. In other words, they didn't need to make a new one, nor change a bad one into a good one. They go on to say, but to make a good one better. Or out of many good ones, one principal good one, not justly to be expected uh, to be expected against. That that has been our endeavor, and that has been our mark. In other words, they said our goal and our mark. What we set out to do was to take the good versions and the the, the one we have, and we wanted to consolidate all of that into one Bible that people could put their hands on and say, "Man, this is a good translation, and it's in English." Then additional, even older documents were discovered, like the Septuagint or the Dead Sea Scrolls, to name just a couple. There were more. In fact, there are over 5,300 manuscripts available today. Now, the King James translators had access to probably 95% of them. The New King James Version used those plus the Dead Sea Scrolls, and their goal was to modernize the language of the old King James with, without losing its form and content. And then you have other versions that come along. Modern versions. The translator of the NIV, by the way. Which takes a beating in the world of social media. And some of you don't even know anything about it. But you're like, I don't like the NIV because they changed this. And I saw this on Facebook. Well, let me tell you something. There were a hundred theologians that worked for just a little over ten years. Painstakingly. To go in to make this modern translation. And, and many of them, many of them are well respected scholars, well respected Bible teachers and preachers and theologians. Modern translations also use the ones that older translations didn't have access to. And although they don't really contain a lot of new biblical information, what they did have was things that were worded differently. Because languages change and evolve over time. And translators um, had to understand that and use it. And they maybe needed to clarify something. Because you lose something in translation. And anybody who speaks two languages will tell you that's a fact. Even right now in today's modern society. <clears throat> As the writers of the KJV put it. Thought patterns and syntax differ from language to language. Faithful communication of the meaning of the writers of the Bible demands frequent modification 
and sentence structure. In other words, if we're going to make you understand what the original writers wrote, we have to change a few things to make you understand it in your language because you can't understand it in their language and we don't have an equivalency for it, if that makes sense. And that's just one example. So you'll see some phrases and sentences and verses or words that appear in one translation that don't appear in another or that may not be in the original. For example, a, a dynamic equivalency, a phrase by phrase or thought by thought may have extra words to complete a thought or leave out some words or change a particular word without losing the meaning. By the way, verses as we know them, somebody will say, see that right there? See that right there? That chapter, that verse is not in that Bible. Well, verses weren't even in the Bible at all until 1555 when Robert Stephanus introduced his verse division into the Latin Vulgate edition. And this verse edition was then introduced into the English Bible in 1557. And then the whole Bible was divided into chapters and verses. And it first appeared in the Geneva Bible about 1560. And then in the King James Version in 1611. And so I remember when the message paraphrase came out, people were like, I don't like that because it doesn't have the verses in it. Well, no duh, because it was written to be a paraphrase, to read like a book, like it was actually written. They didn't write it with verses and chapters in it before. They sure didn't put subheadings in it. Most of it was written as letters or history documents about the things of Egypt, or Israel. So let me show you a good example of what I mean with the words and the phrases and such. And this is a very short and simple one, but a good example nonetheless. So stick with me. Mexican Spanish, when you speak Mexican Spanish, you use the word tu, T-U, tu. If you are speaking to a single person and you use esteres, if, you, uh, if one is speaking to a group of people. Now this distinction has been completely lost altogether in modern English, except for if you're in the South where we use the term y'all. But it was present in Jacobian English. That's why if they meant you, the singular person, they wrote thou. And if they meant a group of people, they wrote ye. So you'll see sometimes in a translation like the NLT or the NIV, for instance, they use the word them instead of he. Or, they'll, or you. Or they'll use the word... Um, people instead of he or him or, 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 or whatever instead of man or him they'll use people and then they later on because people griped about that later on in 2011 they did an updated version of the NIV and they put the original um, personal pronouns back in which is fine either way and I'm not trying to make a distinction, I, and I am using NIV on purpose because some of y'all just go crazy over it. I'm telling you, be careful when you say these things because all you're doing is feeding into the enemy's try, uh, attempt to make the public, and unbelievers especially, to believe that there's problems with the Word of God and there's problems inside the Bible. The main point here is that you need to be very careful about learning theology off the internet and social media because people see things or read things, and, and, and let's be honest about it, they almost never verify things honestly. And just because you've seen it a lot or heard it a lot throughout the years doesn't make it true. There are not only liberal theologians that are writing things that water down the gospel so much that it's hardly even recognizable on the internet. But also there are atheists that are writing theological articles that will make it look like and sound like it came from somebody who knows what they're talking about. But their goal is to completely discredit, twist and tear down the word of God. So you better be careful. You just remind, remind yourself when you start looking at stuff on the internet. You remember that commercial? If it's on the, if it's on the internet, it must be true, right? You remember that commercial? Wee oui, wee, oui, where the guy comes up and says he's a French model and he looks like a caveman. Anyways, back to the original point. Hopefully that didn't distract you too much. I just wanted to make some, 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 some theological points there. 
There are no errors or contradictions in the scripture. So I, the reason I went through that whole litany of stuff was just to show you just because there are differences in a translation or difference in an English version as opposed to a Spanish version or a Japanese version or the old English um, Jacobian version, for instance. You know, or if you go to the Geneva Bible and you see, well, I, what in the, in the same, it's just to show you these are not errors. They're, they're just differences. People say, well, no, there are contradictions. Well, let me, let me help you understand something about contradictions, first of all. Just because something is said a different way. And I'm going to show you a really good example of this in just a second. Remember, we're talking about something that's God-breathed. You say, well, why are you going through all this, Pastor? Because here's the thing. It's important for us to understand that when God breathed it, He breathed it right. And when it's translated, it's translated from right into the right in that language, if that makes sense. And it's right. You can trust it. You can put your life into it. And you can put it into your life. So in order to understand if there are contradictions or not, you need to understand the laws of logic. Because that's where all of this contradiction stuff comes from. You say, well, I don't want, to, I don't want a lesson in logic. You need a lesson in logic. The second lesson, the second law of logic says this. It's called the law of non-contradiction. And that law says... That there can be two expressions of the same event as long as one does not exclude the possibility of the other. There can be two expressions of the same event as long as one does not exclude the possibility of the other. And if they don't exclude the possibility of the other, then you don't have a contradiction. In other words, let me explain to you a little differently so you can get it because some of you are going like, what, huh? Say that again. I can see right into your living room. I know you're doing it. In other words, you can have two statements about the same event from two different people that are different statements. And as long as one statement does not prove the other statement false, you have no contradiction. Do you get that? See, this happened all the time when I was the police. We would go up to somebody and say, what happened? He shot that man. And that was it. Then I would go to somebody else. What did you see? Well, them two jokers over there was arguing, and he said something about his mama. And he said, you don't talk about my mama. And he pulled out a knife, and the man said, you better put that knife down, or I'm going to shoot you. And the man swung at him with a knife, and he pulled out a gun and shot him. Same story. One of them has a lot more description. The other one just says he shot him. One of them says it was a knife. The other one didn't say anything about a knife. One of them said he talked about his mama. The other one didn't say. But these two things don't contradict each other. In fact, let me tell you a rule of evidence that is also a rule of logic. When you have statements about the same event that are exactly word for word, they have either been copied from each other or rehearsed. And when I had witnesses that would tell me the exact same thing word for word, I knew they were lying. It's a fact. So I want to show you from the Bible, one of the more popular ones, and I want to examine why they are different. And so you can help hopefully start understanding some things about this. And you won't buy into these lies that the enemy tells us about contradictions and errors and lies about the word of God. Let's talk about the death of Judas, because this is one of the biggest ones that people bring up. Matthew says that Judas went out and hung himself. By the way, Matthew was a tax collector. Anybody ever dealt with a, an accountant? Anybody ever dealt with a tax person? They know how to get right to the bottom line, right? They're just the facts, ma'am. They're like Sergeant Friday. It's not like, yeah, but I bought my car and I was driving around here. And they're just like, nope, did you drive your car for pleasure or for business? That's all I want to know, right? Did you make that? Was it a gift or did you earn it? What would you spend it on? You know, it's just like, give me the bottom line. Boom, 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 boom. Matthew says that Judas hung himself. Luke who was a doctor in Acts chapter 1, who wrote Luke and Acts, by the way, he says that Judas fell headlong into a field and his entrails or his intestines burst out. And then people go, see? See right there? There's a contradiction. But those don't actually contradict. Both stories share the essential details in a complementary way, giving different parts and versions of the same story. And let me show you why. Judas did hang himself. You read Matthew's account. And then you read Luke's account. 
you'll understand the full picture. Judas did hang himself. He hung himself after he threw 30 pieces of silver that he was paid for betraying Christ back into the temple to the high priest and, and the Sanhedrin. And then they said, um, they, 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 they said, well, well, one verse, they said that he bought a field. Luke said that he acquired a field. Well, he did buy a field, but he didn't buy it. He just acquired it. That's what Luke says. He acquired it. And let me tell you how he acquired it, because when they threw the money back in, you'll see this in the Bible. It's history. It's the Bible. I'm not trying to make something up. He went and he said, I can't live with this. I can't take this money. It's blood money. He regretted what he did. He threw the money back to him and they said, we don't want your money. And he said, he, and he left. So they didn't want to put it back in the treasury because it's now it's tainted. It's blood money and they didn't want it. So they went out and bought a field to bury strangers in and they bought it in the name of Judas. Matthew said the same thing Luke did, just a little differently. Matthew said it plain. He hung himself. Luke says, let me tell you what happened when, when he hung himself. Uh, I'll show you this some more. And for the ones who say you're just rationalizing, you're just trying to explain things away. Well, first off, duh. That's what you do when you try to figure stuff out. <laughs> Secondly, this type of language is well established in the Bible. Let me show you one. John, John chapter 19, verse 1. It's not in your outline, but I just want to show you. John 19, verse 1 says this. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Is Pilate the one who beat Jesus? Do like this. The answer is no. His guards beat Jesus for him, but they did it according to his answer. So the Bible says that Pilate did it. Does that make sense? Because it shows you how this language is already established. And you can see it in many, many other places. That's just was a really convenient example. Well, what about where it says he fell headlong and burst open? Well, let me tell you. If you recall, this happened the day, actually the night before Jesus was crucified. So he would have been hanging there on the Sabbath. And they would not have wanted to cut him down because that would have been work they would have had to do on the Sabbath. And they're not going to do that. So he would have been left hanging there in the hot sun for at least a full 24 hours or more. And as corpses do, he began to de decompose and rot and he bloated. Now, many of you that hunt have seen this before. When you kill an animal, you just leave it there in the sun for just a little while and gases will be starting to release and that animal will bloat. I've seen this in human beings when I was a police officer and your medical professions professionals that you know will tell you the same thing. It's what happens to a human body. And so when they finally did get around to cutting him down, he fell headlong and when he hit the ground because of the decomp decomposition and because of the gases and all that that was there, he burst open and his entrails came out in the field. And you say, well, how do you know that's what happened? Because bodies don't just burst open when they fall. If I were to fall off this stage, my body wouldn't burst open. In fact, if I were to fall off two stories, my body, if I were to jump off the top of this building, my body wouldn't burst open. I've seen people fall from great heights and your body just doesn't burst open like that. Unless it's full of gases and it's been decomposing. It's a medical fact. And by the way, why did Luke say he fell headlong? Because it's an established medical fact that men's center of gravity is from their waist up. The majority of our weight we hold in our center of gravity is from the waist up. Women, their center of gravity is from the waist down. That's why they balance things better than us. That's why they're able to do things that require balance. That's why they can walk in those giant high heels. And we would kill ourselves trying to do it. Because they have balance. That's just a fact. So what you have here is not a contradiction at all. You just have a tax collector that says he hung himself. And you have Luke, who is a physician, who gives a detailed account of the gruesome medical facts that happened at the end of this man's life. It just makes sense. It would be like me and, 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 and a doctor watching a, 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 a car wreck. And the police show up and say, well, what happened? And I say, well, that car hit that one and that dude got killed. 
You know, I'll probably get a little more detail on that because I used to be a policeman, but most of y'all would say that, man. Them two jokers hit each other and that dude dead. Right? But a doctor wouldn't say that. A doctor would say, well, these two, these two cars hit and this man was ejected up into the air and when he fell, he hit on his head and, and, and based on the swelling and bruising that I see, he, he probably had an aneurysm and, and he died. You see, they just give you those facts. So what I'm saying is people need to be careful, very careful when they are talking about the Word of God. Because we are born again by the Word of God. You've got to understand that. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed that abides forever. The Word says heaven and earth will pass away, but this Word will by no means pass away. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God will stand forever. The angels, mighty in strength, watch over the Word to perform it. That it will always return, but it will never return void. But it will always accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. It's life to those who find it, and it's health to the whole body. It's sweeter than honey, and it's purer than gold. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and divides between the soul and the spirit. And the Word of God will stand forever. This book is God's Word, and it stands forever. And you better be careful how you talk about it. Now, I cannot make you believe in God. And I cannot make you believe that the Bible is His Word. But you have to have faith about some things. But once you believe it is His Word and you understand it, it will change your life forever. This book is life. I've said that several times. I want to say it again. This book is life. Okay. Now, how is that for an introduction? <coughs> All right, I told you I have four points. And I want to get into them real quick. I'm going to read ten scriptures, and then we're going to look at these four points in very, very quick fashion. I'm not even going to comment a lot about them because they really don't have to have a lot of comment, commentary. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 10. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out, of the, brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Notice that they were not skeletons, they were just bones scattered around. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, they were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, O Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And, I, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Now this is when they became a skeleton. And in verse 8 says, Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Now they look like people, but they're not alive. Also he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. And verse 10 says this, And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now, that's a crazy, wild, amazing, miraculous story. And, you know, there are a lot of people that go, you know, that's stuff like that that I just can't, I can't get a hold of. I just can't wrap my brain around that. People will say, that's, that's some of the reason I can't believe the Bible. Remember, I told you this. If you're going to go by just the stuff you can understand, you're going to have a serious problem with the Bible because the just shall live by faith. But, you know, I find it amazing that the very same people that will say something like, I don't believe that story, also believe that at the end of the world, zombies are going to walk around in some kind of apocalypse. Go figure. Anyways, four quick points are all going to come from these ten scriptures. Here's number one. The breath of God brings understanding. 
Verse 3 says this. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, O Lord God, you know. In other words, he said, God said, can this happen? Does this make sense to you logically, Ezekiel? And Ezekiel says, I don't know, God, but you know. It'd be like God asking somebody, can a man walk on water? Or better yet, how can a man walk on water? And you go, well, I don't know, God, but you know. That's what was happening here. The word of God brings understanding. Job 37 verse 9 says, But there is a spirit in a man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. You notice that word breath. And we're talking about that it's the breath of life. The breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Now, how many times have you made this statement? If I could just understand why I'm going through this. If I could just understand what God is doing. If I could just understand why this is happening. This is what gives you understanding. Let me tell it to you like I heard it from a preacher one time. Read the owner's manual from the manufacturer and it'll make sense. This is how you understand. Here's number two. The breath of God brings order. If you need order to any part of your life, it's the breath of God, scripture, that brings order. Verse seven says this. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, I was speaking the word God told me to speak. He breathed it out, I breathed it in, I began to speak it. As I prophesied, he said, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone, and the bones became skeleton when Ezekiel spoke God's words. In other words, he's saying, when I said what God said to say, order came to chaos. Do you see that? Psalm 33 verse 6 says this, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of, of them by the breath of his mouth. And here's one everybody knows, Genesis chapter 1 verses 2, 3, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Why was there light? Because God said it. He breathed and order came to chaos. Here's number three. So when there was nothingness, chaos was there, God spoke and order came. Do you see that? Number three. God breathed or the breath of God brings strength. The breath of God brings strength. Verse six says this. I will put sinews on you and I will bring flesh upon you. Verse 8 says, Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. Now, a sinew is the tendon that connects the muscle to the bone. So you need to understand this. Watch this. Watch this now. It's important. The, the physical, medical thing is going to show you something very, very, very important in the spiritual. So it connects the structure to the power. It connects the order to the power. It connects the bone to the to the muscle, which is where the power comes from. So when God's word, God's breath brings strength, God brings structure and order into your life, but you need something to connect you to the power, and it, His word is what connects you to the power. Let me show you how powerful the breath of God is. Exodus chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. This is the song of Moses. Revelation 15 says that we will sing it in heaven. I heard one preacher say you might as well get used to it now or you're going to have to look at the screens when you get up there. Here's what it says. And, when the blast of your nost and with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap and, and, and the depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue and overtake, and I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them, and I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. But you blew with your wind, and the sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. So let me show you what that's showing us. I want you to look at me very closely, because here's what's happened. This is what this shows us. You want to know how the Red Sea parted? God went like this. <laughs> And it parted. It said a blast from your nostrils. And it parted. And then he did another one. 
and it covered them up. God doesn't have to conjure something. That's how strong the breath of God is. That's how strong the word of God is. Here's number four. The breath of God brings life. The breath of God brings life. Verse 10 says this. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them and they lived. Now we read earlier that all scripture is God breathed. And when you read this word, when you take in this word, when you get this word inside of you, you get understanding. Your life comes into order. You get power from God in your life. And you get life itself. You see that? You are filled with the breath of God. Job 30, 30, 33 verse 4 says this. The Spirit of God has made me. And the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Genesis 2, 7 says this. And the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Word of God is the breath of God. When I study, when I prepare, I'm breathing in the breath of God. All week long, I'm studying, I'm learning, I'm watching, I'm listening, I'm reading, I'm looking, I'm praying, and God's speaking, and I'm catching everything I can, and I'll draw it in, I draw it in, and I breathe it in, and then I come in here and I breathe it out for you, and you breathe in the breath of God. But listen to me, one breath a week is not enough for you. It's not enough. It's a good breath, I hope. But it's not enough. You can't hold your breath that long. You got to breathe. So a couple of weeks ago, I said, eat the bread. Last week, I said, take a bath. So this week, I'm going to say, eat the bread. Take a bath. And breathe. Take a bath. Eat the bread and breathe in the breath of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is life, that your word is the very breath of God for us, in us, as you breathed it out. Holy men breathed it in. They were inspired breathe God breathe scripture you gave it to us in this written form you are the logos the living word your breath gives life you are life itself and so I pray that we would be saturated with you saturated with your word that we would eat and breathe and bathe in and take in your word in every form we can your breath is life your word is breath and we need you in your word Give us a hunger for it, Lord. It can change us forever. And God, if there's one person here today who's saying, they're listening to me and they say, I, I need that breath. I need, oh God, I just need to breathe. Can't breathe. You know, I hear people so often, Lord, and they say, the pressure of life is on me so much and I just can't breathe. Help them, God. Breathe into them. As they call out to you, call out to God right now. Man of God, woman of God, call out to God right now. If you're lost and confused and hurting and lonely and you need God, call out to Him right now and the breath of God will come over you and come into you. And it will change you forever. He'll save you. And He'll wash away your sin and He will make you white as snow. And He'll write your name in His book. And man, you'll have life in you. Do it now. Don't wait. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we love you. God, I pray that you help us to have a passion for your word like never before. And like the prophet said, it would be a fire shut up in our bones. It cannot be contained. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen and amen. Now I took a little extra time this week, but I think this is so important. And I pray you receive from it. We're going to continue with this series next week. We're going to be talking about dominion. So I want you to get ready. Breathe this week. Breathe this week. 
Breathe. And watch as God breathes through you. Listen, if you prayed that prayer or you want us to pray for you, just click that link and it says, I'm new here. Pray for me. I need prayer or whatever it says up there. And uh, we'll be happy to get in touch with you. And, uh, and we love you. And uh, until we see you again, God bless you.